Okay, guys, well, let's, let's go ahead and get started. And first of all, I want to say thank you guys for joining me today on, uh, you know, another coaching session, another Zoom coaching session. Uh, again, kind of a short notice on this. So I appreciate you guys jumping on. And uh, what we're going to work on today is uh, this whole thing about mental toughness. And I, I think it's, you know, it's really a very common coaching term or a very common, um, you know, something that we're supposed to learn, right? Obviously the mental part of tennis or the mental part of sports, mental part of any skill is, is crucial to, to really maximizing the other skills that you got to bring to the party. And so in this case with tennis, um, you know, the mental part is, is, is really important. Um, for a couple of reasons. Number one is, is emotionally to keep yourself in a evenly on emotional keel so that you're not bouncing all over like kind of a, you know, uh, just from the highs down to the lows. And, and, and the more that that happens for you, uh, the tougher it gets to really concentrate during the point. And let's be honest. I mean, I'm, I know all of you guys have probably played against someone who has started to go crazy over there and it makes you feel a little bit better right? It makes you feel pretty good. And so um, mental toughness, that term, I, I, I always struggle with. I, I, and, and, and for me, it really started back. Uh, GGP, this is when I knew something was wrong. This was at Golden Gate Park back in the 70s. And, you know, really back in the 70s, I was really starting to try to play. I really didn't have any designs on because I was already, you know, 20. I was in my early 20s, really hadn't played a lot of tennis as a junior played some, but, but just really kind of one summer when I was 14, even though we were, you know, I've been lifelong members uh, or lifelong member of the Berkeley tennis club. Uh, when I was born, my mom and dad were members there, but I didn't play a ton of tennis as a kid. I played a lot of baseball and that was really my, my focus. And so when I really started to take up competitive tennis seriously, um, that was really more when I was in my mid starting to get in my late twenties and I started playing tournaments right? Started going out there and I started playing tournaments in, and, and um, I remember my first match uh, I played was uh, ironically against a guy who I was practicing with all the time at the Berkeley Tennis Club. Um, and this guy, Bill, was, was a good player, but for whatever reason, you know, in practice, we were pretty even. I, I would say that I was you know, I wasn't, you know, winning all the, all, all the matches, but I was winning enough of them and, and to feel like I was close to them. And, and even the ones where I was losing, I was still splitting sets. And so um, I remember one day he came back or I guess it was a weekend. Like and we were playing again, like on a Monday or Tuesday and he came back and, and um, we just got chatting. and he said, yeah, you know, I played a tournament this weekend. And I said, wow, where? And he said, well, I said, you know, I can't, I can't remember what he said, but he said, you know, somewhere in Northern California. And he said, look, you know, you got to you start playing some tournaments. They're fun. I said, all right. So I signed up for this tournament. Like in a couple of weeks, it was in Walnut Creek, Northern California. And uh, lo and behold, of course, who would I draw first round? But my buddy, Bill Steggy. And uh, so I go out and I just go, oh, okay, well, this is kind of, you know, kind of a bummer, man. I mean, I play, I practice with this, with this guy once or twice a week and now I got to play in first round of the tournament. So anyway, I go out there and uh, the next thing I know is I get in the court, we're warming up and I'm just tighter than a drum. I cannot believe what I'm feeling. And we start the match and I literally, I mean, I was so nervous. I was so tight. I could barely get a ball in the court and like it, you know, after the first set, I think he kind of even came over to me and said, man, what's going on? Are you okay? And I said, Bill, I don't, I don't know, man. This is kind of weird. Anyway, um, I ended up losing the match, love and love, O and O. And I just remember feeling just completely mortified. And I got back in the car and, um, you know, kind of looked in the rearview mirror at myself and just said, look, you got to figure this thing out. I don't know how you're going to do it. But um, so... I signed up for another tournament and this one was in Golden Gate Park. That's the reference to the GGP there that you can see on the screen. And this is in San Francisco and, you know, great tennis facility, great public facility in San Francisco. And I go out there and I play this guy who I don't first, first, first round. 
And look, I mean, the guy comes out with one, maybe two rackets, and he's got, you know, I think he's got some old gym T-shirt, all ratty and holy, and he just looks terrible. And I'm going, oh, my God. I mean, this guy's going to enter a tournament? I go, okay. So I go out there, and I play this guy, and the next thing I know is this guy is refusing to miss a ball. I mean, he is like my first real, you know, quote-unquote pusher, and I'm not – you know, I'm not being derogatory about pushers because, my gosh, I mean, it is a strategy that works, but I'd never really seen it in, in live action, at least against me before. So I go out there, and here's this guy, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to size him up in terms of how he looks, how the strokes look, all this kind of stuff, and I'm going, how can I possibly be losing to this guy? And within about halfway through, through the first set, I am so frustrated. I'm going so crazy that I start chucking my racket here and ch start chucking my racket over there. And the next thing you know is, you know, I can see him over there kind of, you know, he's kind of got the shoulders up, kind of chuckling a little bit when I'm, you know, getting all ticked off and I can't control myself. And so match is over. I lose and I lose pretty badly. I don't even know what the score was, but it was, you know, it was not close. And I remember afterwards just saying, I, you know, I just sort of want to be by myself. I go up in the, they had some bleachers up there and I went up there and I just was, you know, kind of, you know, woe is me. What am I going to do? And I'm starting to watch another match. And here's another match with a guy out there who looks like he's doing the same thing that I'm doing or that I was doing in terms of going crazy. And so I start thinking to myself, this guy looks like an idiot. I mean, is this what I look like, like for the last hour? Um, and so I kind of knew right then and there, I, I got to figure this out because number one, I don't want to look like this guy that I'm seeing out there if that's what I'm doing. But number two, I'm realizing this isn't, this isn't working, right? I mean, this, this whole thing of going crazy and emotionally just going, you know, off the deep end is, is obviously not working. So I decided that I had to, and I, at the time I heard this thing, mentally tough. You've got to be mentally tough. And so I started thinking about that. And, you know, for me, it was like, all right, well, mentally tough is like, you know, I've heard like the Navy SEALs, right? The Navy SEALs have this mindset where they don't feel any pain or they might feel pain, but they just ignore it, right? And they're just like steel. I mean, they're, they're so fast past stoic. I mean, these guys are, are just incredible. And so for me, I tried to sort of go out and sort of imagine, well, I'm a Navy SEAL, right? Or I'm like, I'm like one of these guys, you know, my next tournament. And it, it kind of helped a little bit, but, um, I was still just tighter than a drum. I mean, I just was so nervous and, and I was just absolutely kind of white knuckling the whole thing, if you will. Right. Showing no emotion and yet thinking, this is what I need to do. I need to need to be, I need to be mentally tough, right? I need to have this Navy SEAL mindset. I can't show any emotion whatsoever. And so I started doing that and, you know, tournament after tournament, you know, I was just white knuckling my way mentally um, through these matches and you know, maybe making a little bit of progress. I think the only progress I was making, not because I was getting mentally tough, but only because I was playing more tournaments and, and kind of settling in a little bit. And I was probably practicing more and thinking, well, maybe that's the key. I just got to practice more between these tournaments and that'll, that'll take away the nerves that will, that will kind of break through all this, all this emotional stuff. And I eventually got an opportunity to work with Tom Stowe, the great legendary uh, Northern California coach who um, goes way back. And I got him at the end of his life, right? I got him at when I was, this was like 82, 1982, 83. And so, right. I mean, the story when I started playing Bill Steggy, that was in like 1974. So it took me another nine years to be able to finally get a coach you know, be able to finally go, you got to start, stop trying to figure this thing out yourself, this mental toughness, you got, you got to go get a coach. So I asked around Northern California and, you know, by that time, Mr. Stowe was, was retired and he was up in Napa, California. And like I said, he was at the end of his life. And, and like, you know, if, if you look back at his coaching career, I mean, he is the reason that Don Budge won the Grand Slam in 1938. I mean, he really helped Budge, um, not only with his forehand, because Budge already had the great backhand, because Budge played baseball, was a left-handed hitter, already had a great backhand. But Mr. Stowe gave him the forehand, and Mr. Stowe really got him in terms of a tactical all-court 
forcing game. And that's, that's another, that's another story. But I got to Mr. Stowe. He really, he really helped me a lot in terms of stroke technique, which was let's make it as clean and as simple as possible. Uh, he helped me so much with balance and, and he started giving me this all court forcing game concept, which, you know, I, I totally got into, but there'd be so many times in the practice court with him that I would get frustrated and I would just, you know, I would just start losing it. And he would just come up to me and he would do two things. Number one, he'd get he'd eight stop and he'd get right in front of my face and he'd take his, you know, this guy was, he was all, he was just, you know, he was old and sick and he was literally a year away from, from passing away. But he got right up my face and he, and he took his hand and he started waving it in front of my face. I mean, literally just, you know, a few inches from my face. He says, you know, every time you get upset like this, it's like your opponent is coming over the net during the points. Your opponent's hitting the shot to you and then they run over and they wave their hand in front of your face. You're just trying to, you're just, you're just getting in your way so much that, um, Brent, you need to take it like a man. And I thought, well, maybe this is what mental toughness is all about. Take it like a man. So I went out there for a little bit longer and I tried to, you know, quote unquote, take it like a man. Well, I think the mental part of the game, I didn't really get that didn't really work for me with Mr. Stowe, everything else that he did for me. There's no question that any success I've had as a player or as a coach, Mr. Stowe gets hundred um, percent. But the take it like a man thing did not, did not work for me. So the whole thing of mental toughness, that was the way that I was interpreting it was you got to have this Navy SEAL mindset. You can't show any emotion. You know, you got to white knuckle your way through this, no matter what you're feeling um, or you got to take it like a man. And so what was happening to me is now I was eventually not, I was able to not show anything on the outside, but I was still going absolutely bonkers on the inside. So even though maybe I wasn't really helping my opponent by showing outward emotion, I still wasn't really wasn't moving the needle in terms of getting better in terms of mental toughness. Right? So really the thing that I discovered that completely changed everything for me and um, was this notion that uh, 80% of the match happens when we're not playing points, right? So 80% of the match happens between points. It happens on side changes. And, you know, if you look at, if you look at, I mean, maybe some of these crazy clay court, matches, you know, can go on, you know, a, a point can last for what? 25 seconds. That's pretty long, but the rules of the game give us 25 seconds between points, right? Well, even at the very top levels where points are going on and on, that's still 50%. But for the rest of us, the reality is, is that 20% of the time that we're on the court during a match is only the time that we're done um, is, is, is only time that spent playing, playing points. So 80% of the matches between points. And what I finally realized that uh, I just started having this sense that, you know what, well, maybe, maybe it's not about mental toughness. Maybe it's about how do I manage that 80% of the match, right? And so what I eventually came upon was a book by one of the original tennis mental guru guys, a guy named Jim Lore. And I don't remember the title of the book. If I, you know, if anyone knows it, remembers it, I don't, I don't remember what it was. I mean, I'd love for you to put it in the chat. But what the one thing that I got out of that book that I really, really vividly remember that really hit me right between the eyes, like this is it, was he, he, he really emphasized the 80% of the match. And he says, what you do between points is what makes you mental i mean is is really the mental part of the game and for and 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 he laid out a four part between points routine four parts between points routine and and so once once i once i believed it and i started to practice it and i started to deploy it in matches um all of a sudden i could feel that me getting better as a player that this big weight has sort of been lifted lifted off of me and that I didn't have to be mentally tough, right? I didn't have to be a Navy SEAL. I didn't have to, you know, I could show a little bit of emotion, but it was so minimal 
that um, it didn't go from, yay, man, I've just hit the greatest running forehand up the line of all time. Come on, baby, and let's let everybody around know that. Or I've just played the point, and the guy's chunked up a little sitter. He's fallen down in the alley. All I got to do is dink it in the court. And yeah, lo and behold, I miss it and then go crazy, right? Then so from the highs to the lows emotionally. So once I, once, once I started practicing that four-part between points routine that I got from Jim, I started to hybridize it for me. And here's what I'm going to really encourage you guys to do. To, 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 uh, to do. And this is, you know, I, look, I, I know we're all just starting to get back into uh, we're all just starting to get back into getting out in the courts. And depending on what state you're in, what city, what county, um, you know, some places you can't. Some places like here at Mission Hills in the desert, we've been playing tennis. I mean, there was maybe a week where we couldn't play, and then we got back on with some restrictions. You know, it's been wide open for, you know, I think, a few weeks now. But, but that said, sheltering a place, this is a perfect time to practice this, what I do, which is a four parts between points routine that you can hybridize for your own. And, 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 and yet what you've got to be able to do is sort of visual, you kind of visualize yourself when you're off the court as you're playing a point. And I do this and, and, and look, I'm going to go through each one of these four, four parts. So, um, but I do this even when I'm practicing a ton and, and even, and, and even when um, I'm getting ready for a tournament or I'm playing a tournament. And so, for example, let's say tomorrow I'm at a tournament. I'm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, you know I'm playing Dave Severson tomorrow. I'm playing I don't know who somebody. And the night before, I will actually visualize myself in a in that match with Dave the next day, and I'm I'm going to visualize um, you know winning a long point, winning a great point. I mean, that's a close match, five all in the third set. I win this point. How do I want to respond? And I'm going to go ahead and visualize it as if I'm actually playing the match. And the other thing, too, is I'm going to, I'm going to visualize, you know, a point and, to, you know, all of a sudden he hits a great shot. And, and how do I want to react? How do I want to react on that? So, JJ, thank you. Um, mental toughness training for sports achieving athletics of 1986. Well, the timing then would be just about perfect, according to my story. Jeff, thank you very much. Um, so here's the, whole, there, here's, here's the whole thing that's helped me with the four parts between points routine is immediately after the last point, or immediately after the points finished, when I go through the 20, 25 seconds that we get between points, I go through a routine. It's the same thing every time. And what it does for me, it helps clean the slate for what just happened in that, in that last point. Yeah. I mean, I might've lost a tough one to really, you know, God, I really wanted to win this point, but I lost it. But for me, what happens is it keeps my emotional keel from just taking a big hit to where now I've got to somehow, somehow really kind of, you know, um, get myself out of the dumps. And on the other hand, just like I said, if I've just played a great point, I don't want to go super sky high on that. I don't want my brain to go through these expectations of, well, this is how you should be playing every point. Or if you lose a point, you know, hey, man, you can't. So anyway, um, it helps me clear the slate so that I'm ready to play the 20% of the match, right, which is the start of the next point. So here it is, part one. Part one, as soon as the point's over, I, I, I got to have the same response emotionally uh, at the end of a point. And for me, what I've done is, yeah, I've taken a little bit of the emotion out of it by um, I've tried going to a word. I've tried going to a phrase, um, you know, series of words. I've tried a, a bunch of different things. I've tried a kind of a vision. Well, what's, what's the picture I want to have in my mind right after every point? For me, the easiest thing has been to um, start humming or start singing the hook to a song. So what's the hook of a song, right? It could be the chorus. It could be some part of the song that, that, that I just like. And whether it's an instrumental or whether it's a, um, you know, it's got lyrics to it, 
for me, what it does, and I'm not saying this is what you have to do. I know that you know, a lot of our players don't want to you know, sing a song or hum a song. They've got a term. They've got a phrase. They've got one word. They've got something that they go to at the end of every point. And what that does is it starts to clean up the end of the point emotionally. How often do we finish a point? The point's over physically, but we keep, we keep it, we kind of keep into it emotionally. And what I want to do is I want to end it. Sure. I mean, if there's something that happened there that I need to remember for future points down the road, um, that's going to be intuitive. That's going to be instinctive. Um, it could be that, wow, I've just served the guy out wide and I, I find that, you know, he can't handle that. Okay. But I'm not going to at the, at, you know, at the end of that point, you know, do a come on baby uh, type of thing because that may not be the response I want after every point. So for me, it's the hook to a song. And again, that starts the sequence, my four part sequence. And that's maybe three seconds, four seconds, five seconds. I just, it, it just helps calm me down, right? The second part is going to be three deep breaths um, from, my, from my core, from my abs, right? Because in theory, points, even, you know, you need to recover. And, and to make sure that I stay in the routine, part two, if, if the guy's just double faulted to me, I still do that anyway. Because the cleansing, right, of the breath, the cleansing of the mind is sort of like that's part two. Not only do you recover physically, but, but the deep breath also helps you mentally as well. So uh, the third part is my strategy to start the point. So look, it's 40-15, right? It's five all in the third set, it's 40-15. And if I've done part one, great, part two, great. But if I go to part three and go, oh my God, man, it's five all, third set, I'm getting tired, 40-15. I got to win this point. Well, what can I do to win the point? And which is the result. And, and, and typically what happens is, is the, the result is not great because you can't control every part of the point. The only thing you can control is your intention of how you're going to start the point, right? You might be thinking, well, I got I to hit an ace out wide or I got to hit an ace up the tee or I've got to take this return and hit a winner, something like this. Because if I'm telling, if I'm telling myself, I mean, you know what, it's 40, 15, I got to take this guy out wide, I got to win this point. And he might guess, right? I might hit a perfect out wide serve, perfect, right? Even better than maybe the two or three that I'd hit earlier in the match that he never got to. And this one's even better. But you know what? He guessed, or he anticipated that I was going there. And the next thing I see is I feel the ball come off the racket and I see it go over there and I know, Oh my God, that's perfect. And I go, uh Oh, here it is. It's coming back. He's loading up on his forehand over there and he's unloading and boom. And so now all of a sudden my, my, my whole emotions of, Oh boy, Oh boy is now gone down here. And so what you got to make sure that you do is that part three is how do you want to start this point, right? The serving part's easy you absolutely know what you're going to do. Um, and you should know, right? And you should know, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm to strategically serve here uh, because up to this point in the match, this, is, this has been working. Or maybe it's 40 love and, and you, you, you feel like, why not show him a different serve than what you've been serving? Not that you're willing to kind of throw away a point, um, but it's – why not, why not show them something different? Just because even if you, even if you lose that point, um, at least now you put that thought in your mind come future points to where you just serve. Hey, yeah, most of the time I was serving over there, but man, there's a chance I could be serving somewhere different. Um, so you're always trying to keep them, you know, you're trying to keep yourself unpredictable in terms of their mind of what you're about to do. Um, so again, what's, what's the intention of where you want to start the point when you're serving? When I'm returning serve, I mean, I might have a little anticipation. I might be going, you know, typically what that guy has been doing over there, where it's singles or doubles, they've been serving me here. All right, so I'm going to look for it. I'm going to look for it. Doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to now be able to, you know, do what I'd love to do. Maybe I'm going to take a cross court. Maybe I'm going, whatever. But to me, on the return, my intention to start the point is, is to be just considering 
um, what should I be looking for? And that's not a guarantee, right? So you have to be adaptable. And then the fourth thing is I always give myself a light little positive self pump, right? So again, with no end result, it's not like, okay, um, I've done my little hook to the song to start. I've taken my three deep breaths and I've said, all right, I'm serving to the body. Um, and then the fourth thing is, is not going to be, all right, let's win this point. Come on. We got to get this point. Let's go. Come on. And as, as opposed to, all right, here we go. Here we go. And because again, we can't control every part of the point. You just can't. So that's what's really worked for me, guys. And I think once I, once I started doing this, which is to build this BPR, between points routine, into a habit, um, for me, it, it, I started having wins, right? I started having my best wins. And even if I wasn't winning a category one tournament, a, a gold ball, I was still getting closer and closer. I was still going three sets with, with, with a top guy who I'd never, you know, let's say won a set off of before. Uh, or maybe I was, you know, I, you know, I, I can remember, you know, a couple of matches, but one match in particular, um, David Nash, the great player from, from, from Minneapolis. And we're playing, I don't know, 60 hard courts. Um, I can't remember what round it was. It was maybe round of 16. And, you know, David Nash, wow. I mean, one of the top, this guy's legendary, senior player. And I was definitely the underdog. And I knew on that day, I, all, I, all I told myself, my strategy today is to discipline myself to my four-part between points routine. And because this guy was a big server, loved to serve in volley, big forehand. And so I knew that the points were going to probably be short. And, 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 and I just knew that if I just stick to my routine, that that'll give me the best chance. I mean, that was my, that, that was kind of my match play strategy for the day. And, you know, I end up winning the first set. He ends up winning the second set in a tiebreaker. Um, and then he's serving at, at two, five in the third. And I had continued to go through my four part between points routine the whole time. And, and look, I, I didn't, I never have, well, you know, I, th there might've been a fleeting thought when he's serving at two five uh, going, Oh my God, man, do I have to serve for this thing at five, three? I don't know. You know, I got one shot here. So I, I think there were some thoughts like that, but my thought sort of that overrode it was, was, oh, man, I can't wait to serve this out. I can't wait for the opportunity to serve this out. Well, that whole thought was obviously kind of false advertising for me. But you know what it did? It loosened me up when I was playing that return game at 2-5 and I ended up breaking the guy. And really, that was a big moment for me in terms of building belief, building confidence, not only in myself as a player, but realizing that it's not about mental toughness. It's, it's not white knuckling, right? It's not holding on. It's not like, you know, take it like man. It's really having a plan of what you do between points, of having a plan of what you do for 80% of the match. And the other 20%, you, you can have great intention how you want to start the point, but it doesn't always end up that way, right? You know, so, so anyway, um, guys, I hope this kind of helped you. What I'd love for you to do is to start loading up the, the chat box and let me know, um, you know, if there's one thing that from, from, from the story that, that kind of jumped out at you, um, and, and again, I mean, you know, the last thing here is you got to build your own between points routine into a habit. And so it does take practice. I mean, when I first heard, heard, heard this Jim Lore thing, I thought, okay, well now I intellectually understand it. And I went out and started playing matches and then, you know, maybe at the end of the first set, I would go, oh, okay, well let's try the Jim Lore thing. And it just felt so unnatural, right? It didn't feel like that was me. And it, so it, it really didn't work. And so there was a while after that where I kind of said, well, I'm not sure this thing works until I finally, you know, some either, either in the book or something. And so like, you know, you got to practice this thing and you've got to make it your own, right? You have to hybridize it into your own thing. Um, but you have to understand the concept behind it, which is what you do, how you manage the 80% of the match between points, side changes is really, it, it's just so, so crucial for when you for when you play the point um 
for, for when you play the next point. So, all right, guys. Um, Don is asking, I would love to develop a technique for developing a strategy as I warm up with my opponent and then be able to switch strategies if my opponent adapts to what I am doing. Um, to adapt a strategy as you're warming up. Well, look, Don, if you've never played this, this opponent before, and if you don't have any intel on this opponent, um, meaning that, that you see a, you know, you're, you're playing the tournament and, and you see the guy's name in the draw and you have no idea who he is, but you see that he's from some area or, or anyway, and you start doing some intel, you start calling some friends, say, hey, you know, you know this guy. And if, you know, some guys will say, yeah, I played him before and here's his strengths, here's his weaknesses, whatever. But if you've never played a guy before and you have no intel, the warm-up will give you some information, but unfortunately what happens sometimes is kind of like the match that I played at Golden Gate Park when I warmed up with this guy with, you know, a ratty old gym shirt and, and you know, maybe, maybe one racket. And, and I'm thinking, oh, I got this guy. Look at him. He can barely hit the ball. Well, that was, <laughs> that was not the case, right? So lots of times you can, in the warm-up, you can make, um, you know, poor judgment call on what the match is going to be like and what your strategy should be. So my suggestion is, if you have no intel, you start out with whatever your best game is, right? Whatever your, you know, your quote-unquote plan A is, and you start with there and you just, you know, and you adjust based on, the shot patterns that you're starting to see from your opponent that, that they do well. And if they're doing well with that, well, then maybe you adjust one thing. I think there's a big misconception here about, well, you know, if somebody's not working, then I got to go to plan B. Well, look, your plan A is made up of several different components, right? There's just not like, did I, did I lose you guys? What's going on here? Okay. Whew, that scared me. <laughs> Um, would you guys type into the box that you can still see me? Cause something just my, my screen just, uh, kind of blipped on there. You guys still there with me? Let me know. Just go ahead and type into the, okay, good. Thank you. Um, so I was, I was talking about, um, a plan A and then plan B. And so plan B really should not be a wholesale 180 from your plan A. You know, if you're, let's, let's say you're a pure serve and volley guy and, and, and you find out that, you know, when you're serving to the ad courts, um, he's, he's kind of handling your return and kind of getting it down to your feet and making it, making it tough. Well, that doesn't mean that now you go because of that, then you go all the way to plan B, which would be, well, now I'm going to stay back and rally the ball around until maybe I can find a ball I can approach on. It could be that when you, when you serve into the ad, I mean, when you serve the deuce court, you're successful. You're not going to change that in terms of serving volley. But the ad court, yeah, maybe you change that for a little bit just to see if that adjustment might 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 uh, change things up. Um, so I hope that helps. Uh, what's my procedure when sitting on the changeover? That's a great question. Um, you know, I try to continue to go through kind of an extended version of uh, my between points routine. And I, I guess the reason I say that is because it's really easy for me. I mean, I'm, I've gotten so disciplined now and so comfortable with my between points routine, which is, you know, in a tournament, it's only 20, 25 seconds, right? Well, I, I really have got that, that four parts really kind of really figured out as to how long each one of those parts takes. But once you sit down in the side change, which is you know, 90 seconds, right? Or it could be two minutes if you're after the first game of the second set. So I try to go through the same thing, uh, an extended version, and I try to make sure, I just try to be aware of, you know, is my mind wandering? And one of the ways that your mind can wander is if, you're, is, is if your eyes are, you know, visually, you're starting to look out at other courts, or you're starting to look at if they're, you know, if you've got some, you know, some friends or there are people watching, you're starting to look over there. And so for me, it's really more about keeping my vision within a small little area right there in front of me. Um, and, and just not trying to get ahead of myself. Um, and that's one of the beauties of the four part, uh, between points routine is that it really has helped me not get too far ahead of myself in terms of, 
um, okay, well now it's, now it's 30 all, man, God, man, come on. If you win this point, well, then it's 40, 30. And if it's 40, 30 and you win that point, well, then you're up five, four. And then if you break, and you know, you know how that story goes, right? So you really want to find a way to stay in the moment, in the present, so you don't get ahead of yourself. Obviously, not only between points, but also on that side change. So you have to develop your own routine, right? I can't, I can't tell you anything other than um, then you got to, you really got to, you really got to practice on this stuff. Um, so Dave is saying, played a guy last week after the set, we hit some casual points. He said I was night and day different in the set versus casual. How can I narrow that and be better in the set? So perfect. This is the time you start to practice your, your, your between points routine. When you're casually playing, there's no real um, emotional, um, gotta, I, I want to get this right, but there's, um, oh, darn it, my mind is going blank on this, but you don't, you don't, you know, I mean, playing casual points, you lose a point, yeah, big deal, right? It doesn't mean that, oh my God, now I'm down 1540. So there's that aspect to playing casual points. And I just think that we're less emotional at the end of the point of casual points than we are when we're playing a match. And even if it's not outward, inwards, there's still, you're, you're just starting to, to tighten everything up. And so my suggestion on this, Dave, is you, is you start to develop your own four part between points routine. And look, guys, if you want some help, and, I'm, and I, I've, I've sort of got, you know, an exercise I do with players, which is really discovering what I call the one thing, right? We go through this exercise in terms of what is the one thing right now uh, that we can zero in on uh, with your game and we can make it specific to what you're looking at down below on the screen, which is the core five, right? Technique, uh, the tactics, the mental, physical, or the experiences. We can do that exercise, but we can also really dig in the mental in terms of helping you come up with your, with your what would really feel right for you for a four parts between points routine. Um, right down below on the left-hand side, you know, I'm offering a complimentary free private one-on-one -on -one coaching call. Just shoot me an email, brent at webtennis.com. Let me know you're in, uh, that you're interested. And then I'll send you a link to my online calendar scheduler where you can go ahead and cherry pick a date and time that works perfect for you. Um, and again, that's going to be no charge. I just want to help you on that. Um, Okay. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Thank you, Jeff, again for that. So Salar, how do you create a routine? Um, well, you've got, you've, you've got the four parts right here, right? And again, if you, if you want to jump on a call with me, um, I'm happy to kind of help you build that four part routine. Just shoot me an email, brent at webtennis.com. Um, Don saying, sounds like calmness is the key, smoking a joint before taking the court. Yeah, that can work. Don, yeah, big old joint, you know, big Jamaican spliff, maybe drop a little LSD. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think that would work. But the calmness is, look, I don't want to be calm, right? I, I want to be, I, I want to be, um, I want to be fired up in a way where, where I feel um, I feel ready to go, you know, physically and mentally, I feel alert and ready to go. Um, but I don't, I don't want to keep the emotional thing out of it because, um, I mean, I want to keep the emotions out of it, but yeah, mentally, man, look, we're all trying to win. And yet there could be times during matches when, when things aren't going well. And rather than sort of forcing it and, and telling yourself, come on, man, Come on, you got to stop missing. Come on, man. You got to make, you know, you got to win this point. Come on, man. As opposed to having that trust that if you stay disciplined to your four part between points routine, that you trust it, that you trust that that's the thing that's going to eventually turn the tables for you. And yeah, you might have to make a slight little tweak in terms of strategy or tactic. That's cool. And that's part of number three, right? Part number three is how do you want to start this point? Okay, well, I want to start it a little bit differently. The guy's been eating me up out of the ad cord on his, on his return. So let's try a little tweak on that, but that's fine. But I think the whole calmness thing, 
I just never believed it. I've just never believed, well, I want to get calm, right? To where I don't, I mean, calm to me is like I'm meditating and I, I just am so relaxed. I've got no energy. I've got no nothing. Um, so, uh, hi, Jack. We talked about that. Okay, good. Um, Donna, great explanation of preparation before the match and before each point. Managing your thoughts helps you manage your actions. My favorite thoughts when receiving serve are, come on, give me your best serve. I want a chance to return. Give me your best shot. And then feel disappointment when that serve is a fault. Well, look, I kind of like that, Donna, because lots of times, let's be honest, we've worked ourselves to five all in the third set or whatever the matter where the score is. And now you've earned break point and they're serving it at out. And let's be honest, how many times have you thought to yourself, oh God, man, just please throw in a double fault. Just give it to me. Because you're starting to get that tightness going. You're starting to go, man, I don't want to have to play a return of serve here. So I, 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 you know, and I'll be honest with you. I've had that thought way too many times where I've gone, just, just, could you throw in a double right now? That would really be cool. Um, and, and then the serve comes in and you know what, you're just, you, you, you just kind of chunk it. So I do the same thing in terms of, I assume the serves coming in. I never have that thought of please don't get it in or I hope you double fault or whatever it is. I hope you hit a set of serve so I can do this or do that. I do think to myself, I assume it's coming in. Maybe in a first serve, I'm assuming that where, where they've been serving me for the match, I'm assuming it's coming there. Well, if it doesn't, then I'll make the adjustment. They missed the first serve, then I'm assuming they're going to hit a quality second serve. Maybe what I'm going to do is tell myself, hey, I'm going to step in a couple feet, and if I get the right kind of second serve, I'm chipping and charging. I'm coming in. Maybe I'm playing a dropper, right? How do I, how do I want to start the point? So... Donna, I love that. Um, yeah, Jeff is saying I played a lot of matches. I lost a warm up and won the match. You got to be careful about making major strategy changes before you get into the match a few games or half a set. Totally true. I mean, uh, Jeff, that's just such a great nugget right there. Uh, yeah, Don, as is, 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 you know, both Jeff and I are saying, you can really come away with analyzing the warm up in just the wrong way. And, um, and look, I mean, I also almost sometimes I don't mind losing the warm up because that guy over there, maybe he's thinking, Oh, I got this guy. So Don Parker, no investment. I think what Don is, I'm assuming Don, what you're saying, no investment is, um, I'm not so invested in the outcome that, um, if it doesn't happen the way I want it, that it's, it's you know, going to be just heartbreaking. And look, we all want to win. We don't want to lose, right? That's, that's the whole reason that we're competitive. That's, um, but at some point, you've got to be able de to detach yourself from the ultimate result, which is a win or a loss. You've got to detach yourself in lots of ways. And I've done this before. Lots of ways I've lost matches because I thought, God dang it, if I can beat this guy, you know what's going to happen. And I'm, you know, I'm going to feel this and that. And the guys will, you know, and my ranking and this and that. And I'll, you know, I'll be cool, right? So I've lost matches where um, I, I sort of had that attachment to the result. And, and I've also lost matches because I've, I've gone, God, in matches I should have won, where I've gone, oh, my God, I don't want to lose to this guy. I just can't lose to this guy. And I've lost some matches like that. So You've got to be okay with detaching yourself from the result. And for me, the way I do that is I go through that four part between points routine. And look, I don't know what you're thinking. You might be looking at those four parts and going, well, that sounds pretty obvious. That sounds pretty simple. Um, it is only if you practice the living crap out of it. If you just think, well, I've got it and you write it down on a piece of paper and now you're on a side change, you know, it's somewhere in the end of the second set, you pull it out. Okay, I'll do this. I guarantee it's not going to work. Not going to work. Um, yeah, good one, Andy. Yeah, I love it. Um, you can win the warm up and lose the match. The only focus on the warm up and the only focus on the warm up, the only should focus on the warm up and not make any assumption. Yeah, you know, and like guys, in the warm up for me, 
I'm trying to reestablish good habits that I want to take into the match. And for me, those good habits are number one, am I really honest to God looking at the incoming tennis ball? You know, and if I'm doing it and, 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 am I, and, and, and it's kind of relaxing, I'm not tight forcing myself to look at it, but am I really got a good visual contact with the incoming tennis ball? And am I right at contact, you know, doing a little, you know, outward breath, kind of a little, you know, exhale right at the moment at contact. So I'm not picking my eyes up too early. And am I keeping my head down through contact? So I'm not nervous to see the result of what I just did. I want to establish those good habits in a match. And so I will do that at the same time, peripheral, right? I, I, I can see this guy for the first time, right? I can, I can, you know, make, make some mental notes. All right. I see this, I see that. And, but yet I also know that Brent, don't trust it that now you've got him just because you see, well, he, he doesn't come over the backhand at all. He just slices it. So in the famous words of one of my good friends, Berkeley Tennis Club, Pacific Coast Tournament, I won't name, I won't name names, but he, he was going out to play a match against a guy, good, good, really good friend of mine, beautiful tennis player. And, 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 and I said, hey, well, you play it. He says, well, you know, I'm playing this guy. And, and he says, but, the guy just has a slice back here. And I said, yeah, but it's really good. So be careful. He goes, come on, how could I lose to a guy with a, just a slice back in? So he shows up about 75 minutes later down the ballroom of the Berkeley tennis club by the tournament desk. I, he doesn't look too great. I said, well, how'd it go? I said, I lost two and oh. I said, how was that slice back in? He said, you were right. So um, JJ, thanks for showing up, man. Appreciate your time today. Um, okay, Don Parker's asking, curious is number five, experiences. Yeah, so experiences, um, if you guys are looking down the right-hand corner, the core five, experiences are, um, you got to play, you got to play a lot of tennis, right? You got to play a lot of, you got to practice a lot, and you've, you can't just drill. You can't drill your way. You can't ball machine your way to becoming a better player. Sure, if you want to work on some technique for a little bit in the ball machine, you want to do some cross-court drills or whatever, that's fine. But at some point, you've actually got to start playing points in practice. And you've got to start getting some experiences in practice as to, number one, you know what, I'm pretty good with this pattern. Number two, I keep trying to do this thing that I've been working on with a ball machine, but it's not, it's not working. Maybe just maybe uh, I need to, to, to try to, you know, improvise a little bit on that thing and do something else. Um, and then you got to start playing some league matches. You got to play some tournaments. I don't play league matches. I play more tournaments. I do play some league stuff. And I actually use the league matches as kind of the stepping stone from practice points to practice sets, to practice matches, to a league match, to playing some tournament stuff. Um, but you got to play a ton. You can't, and you can't figure this out mentally in terms of stroke technique. You can't figure it out tactically. Um, obviously, you can't figure it out mentally, number three. And physically, I'm about to sneeze, so excuse me for a second if I do. Uh, the hay fever's kicking in down here, the desert. Um, number four, physical. Look, I mean, <laughs> this whole thing, the whole thing on the screen here, everything on the left-hand side, it's completely dependent. Those, that, that four part between points routine is completely dependent that you're embracing physical. If, if you're going out there, you know, you got an extra 15, 20 pounds you're hauling around, how's it gonna work? You can't, you can't between point routine it. You just can't do it, right? So you gotta get serious about that. Um, and then experiences are, again, you gotta, you gotta practice like crazy got to play a lot of practice points. Um, you got to play a lot of practice matches and you got to, you got to, you got to play a lot, a lot of matches that count, right? Where there's, um, there's some consequence, right? Where it's made public. Well, the best ones are league matches and, and tournaments. As Jeff and I over gold ball hunting said lots of times, look, you guys, another way to do this is play a practice match and, and agree. Both guys agree before the matches. We're going to put the result up on the blackboard inside the clubhouse when we're done. 
or we're going to do a Facebook thing and say, oh, you know, um, and, and just make it public because what you'll do is you'll start to break through that whole feeling of, I don't want to have a, have a certain result. Um, because what's it, you know, what's it, how, how am I going to feel? How's it going to look? Well, look, if that's, if that's the case, then I'm telling you, man, don't, don't, don't play any tournaments. Don't, don't play any league stuff because it's going to completely lock you up. You look at some of the great players and I look at these senior players and I've learned so much from these guys. You know, I'm talking about, you know, the Jimmy Parkers and, and um, you know, the Dick Johnsons and, and the Brian Chaney's um, and, and the guys all over the senior tour who are, you know, my heroes, really. The guys who've not only I've been able to go up to and ask questions to and kind of in that sort of vein that kind of mentored me, but the guys who I've studied I've studied their technique. I've studied their tactics. I've looked at them mentally. What do they do between points? How do they respond when they just miss the easiest shot in a, a big match? You know, physical. I mean, these guys are all in great shape and, and obviously playing their experiences. And so the point I'm trying to get to is that these guys lose and they don't cherry pick. They don't cherry pick a tournament and they look at right before the, the entries close at 11.59 on a Sunday night, they don't look and go, oh, well, let's see who's in there because mm, I'm not sure I want to lose to that guy. Oh, boy, that would be a bad loss to that guy. Um, and then they kind of look and go, well, it looks like I can beat everybody, and they're okay. So um, you want to make sure that you have lots of experiences on your belt. And, you know, I go back to the thing with practicing. Yes, you do want to tinker on stroke technique, but what do I say there with, with technique? technique is really about can you can you pair something away can you do something less with technique and the reason you don't want to get complicated technique is because it makes you inconsistent as a shot maker and and look i'm telling you you look at jimmy parker and if you've never seen him play before the only thing you've ever seen him do is maybe on a youtube video and you know jeff and i used to always laugh you know well what's the deal what's the big deal with jimmy parker <laughs> he hasn't missed a ball since 71 I'm serious. So, and, and you look at the stroke technique, it's so clean, it's so simple, it's so repeatable that that's what you need to build into your game. If you want to practice on the ball machine, if you want to practice in drilling, and let's be honest, what do we do when we practice in the ball machine? We see how big we can hit a ball as if it's never, let's see, okay, I'm going to hit some forehands today as if they would never come back just not realistic. We don't play matches that way. So when you're in the ball machine, see how many balls you can hit to a really realistic uh, cone um, target that's well inside. Put it right in the middle of the quadrant cro cross court. Don't put it next to the sideline. Don't put it next to the baseline. Um, put it right in the middle and see how often you can hit the ball there. And don't think, well, you got to, you know, you got to rip it over there. See how consistent you can be. You know, as Jeff always said, Jeff's always said, you know, let them touch the ball. Good things happen when they touch the ball. Um, I'm getting off on a rant here, guys. Um, <laughs> so I hope that answers on the, uh, about number five. So Andy's saying, I try to use positive focus, execute. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Positive focus, execute. Execute is, is not, a re not an intended result in terms of, winning the point right execute for me is going to be like i was talking about with a warm-up all right i'm going up the line with this backhand what do i need to execute that shot well for me my cue is going to be no peaking right and artificially no peaking right p-e-e-k i'm not gonna i'm not gonna look up everyone else can you know come up with your own cue that works um randall saying give me an example of number four a life cell pump so for me you know, I go through, I go through the song, the hook, the song. I do the three deep breaths, um, strategy to start the point. I'm going to serve the body. And for me, the light positive self pump without any end result in mind is okay. Here we go. Here we go. And it's not a, come on, here we go. You got to do this. It's a real light, uh, just a light little self pump, right? Nothing. Nothing that has anything to do with the result. Um, 
Eric's saying, I often adapt the thought I'd really play well and lose, then play poorly and win. <laughs> well, okay. Um, I got to tell you, and, and, and lots of guys will, will, will back up this statement. Um, I've played really poorly and found a way to win. I mean, really bad. I just did not have it that day. But what I would have done before is emotionally, I would have taken myself out of it. I would start to build a story why I'm playing so bad so that when I was done with the match, assuming I lost, I'd come off the court and some would say, God, man, what, what happened? Well, you know, I did, didn't sleep well last night or whatever. Or, you know, I got stuck in traffic. My mind is, you know, all this stuff. I mean, I can't tell you how many times it has literally not been a beauty contest out there, singles and doubles. And yet uh, I found a way to win. So, um, so I don't want you to, I, I, I don't want you to sort of just assume that if you play poorly, that there's no shot that you're going to win because you got to fight through that thing, right? You got to fight through it in terms of not going crazy in terms of not building a story with excuses and, and there you go. Yeah. Um, Kevin, yeah, there's a great video of Parker playing Cheney on YouTube on the clay. The one that I'm thinking about. I think Brian was just off of surgery. His knee was not great. Um, but totally, yeah. Thanks, Don. Appreciate that. Uh, good, Andy. Yeah. So execute, execute means hit, hit the shot. Swing. Good. Uh, see you, Dave. Um, and, and Andy's saying, we all have made excuses, but it doesn't usually matter. You have to play. Yeah. That's right. So. Guys, how are we doing here? I got uh, about one minute before noon here in the desert. Uh, anything else? And again, um, a couple of things here. Go ahead and just, if there's anything else, I'll wait on there a minute or two here. Uh, but just go ahead and type it in the chat box. Um, a couple of things I want you to think about. Number one is, yeah, if you want to get onto a private one-on-one -on -one coaching call with me, and uh, it's free, just shoot me an email, brent at webtennis.com, and we can get into whatever you want. Um, could be any one of those core five technique, tactics, mental, physical experiences. Um, I'd love to help you. As you guys all know, um, I partnered up recently with a company that I absolutely love, a company called Perium, and, and they, they produce uh, organic plant-based supplements, right? It's not a diet. It's not food. Well, the supplements actually are real food. Um, but boy, I, I've really gotten some great help with these things. And, you know, I always go into these new, I used to, I used to be a vitamin guy, and then I kind of bailed out of that after a while. Um, but for me, <laughs> I, I'm always looking for a tangible result. And, and, and the first thing I got with, with, with Perium is I've not had to take any, any ibuprofen for, uh, for over a month. And, and for me, that's been a big deal because... Um, I just sort of had this systemic kind of lethargy every time I go out and play, right? And so I'd always have to take two ibuprofen, which is not a lot, but um, but still, I know it's not good for my gut, not good for my liver, kidneys, everything. So that's been one really great benefit that I've gotten so far with uh, Purium. The other thing is I'm sleeping a ton better, much deeper sleep, feeling so much better in the morning. Um, and then I've been riding the bike. My, I got a mountain bike here and just every other day, just cranking out these 90 minute in the heat rides. And um, they've got a vegan recovery shake that I'm drinking. And I, you know what? I'm just feeling so much better after that. Where I used to feel kind of weak and burn out, man, I want to you know, shower and go take a nap. Um, I feel, I'm feeling good. So guys, if you have anything physical that you want to talk about, we could do that too uh, in, that, in that private one-on-one -on -one coaching call. Um, let's see what we got here. So does this change when you play doubles? Well, a little bit, um, because what I do in, in doubles is I may not go to the hook of a song, but I feel responsible as a teammate to make sure that my, my emotional response at the end of the point is not super high and not super low. I don't want to do anything to somehow negatively affect my partner, right? And, and, and so I don't do that, right? So I just make sure that the, at, at the end of the point, no matter what happens, whether I chunked an easy one, whether I hit a, you know, a great shot, whether 
my partner chunked an easy one or my partner had a great shot, I'm not going to go emotionally up or down. I'm going to keep that even keel because I want to be the guy. Now, I'm not saying that my partner won't, won't either, but I want to make sure that I'm the one who is keeping us as a team to, you know, at the end of the point to start the between points routine, I'm keeping, I'm, I'm keeping us on, on a nice even keel. Um, and there is some point there where, yeah, I mean, I'll take my three deep breaths and the, the two of us might strategize. We might not. Um, but if, if, you know, we're doing signals, then I'm serving, then my partner's going to give me signals. And that's the strategy, how we're going to start the point. But I always tell myself the same thing at the end, a little light positive self pump. I might say to my partner too, all right, all right, babe, here we go. This is fun. Right? So it changes slightly in doubles, but, I still go through a four a four part routine. Um, and good, Solara. If I I just realized if we focus on the ball instead of the player, it will take the pressure off. Yeah, I mean, obviously, watching the ball and not the player takes a lot of pressure off. Um, this is a tough sport, right? Because it's mano a mano. You've got your opponent right in front of you, right, and you're you're slugging away, and they're and they're countering back to you. So you can emotionally get get way off the reservation in terms of getting kind of connected to that, to that opponent in a real negative way. So for me, the, the end of the point starts that disconnection with my, the, that, that, that disconnection with the personality of my opponent. So that, um, so that I can just start, I can, I can, I'm done with that point. And now I start to clear the slate for the start of the next point. And, uh, and, that, and that definitely helps me. Um, okay, Donna. Yeah, I'm glad this is, glad this has helped. Guys, cool. Um, thanks for hanging out with me today. It's been a good hour. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, looks like the wind, oh, the wind has died down. I, meaning that I've gotta go out there and ride the bike again today. So guys, thanks for hanging out. As always, get out there. Help someone else have a spectacular day. And uh, guys, we'll do this again soon.